can you see, 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 can you see,
Good afternoon, everyone. I am Brittany Stanton, Deputy Director and Assistant Conductor of the Choir School of Delaware, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to We Hold These Truths, a celebration of black excellence, our annual Black History Month concert. Throughout February, we have been learning about black history, celebrating black excellence, and centering black stories. At the choir school, we strive to do this every month, but we value this time of year and this annual concert as an opportunity to come together with a shared focus, to learn, to educate, and to celebrate so that we can work together to create a better future. Black history is our shared history. No matter our race, perspective, or background, we all have a responsibility to learn from our past so that we can see the truths of our present and build a more just and equitable future. As we prepared for today, we held many deep and poignant conversations around the topics presented through the repertoire, especially weather, which anchors today's program. Dr. Rollo Dilworth sets a powerful poem by Claudia Rankine, Weather, which explores the intersection of racial injustice and the pandemic in summer 2020. We are honored to welcome Dr. Dilworth to today's performance, and we look forward to hearing his remarks on this masterwork in a few moments. Thank you, Dr. Dilworth, for joining us today and for leading, lean, <laughs> lending your brilliance and expertise to our students and to me throughout this learning process. We are also grateful to our clinician and panelist, Waigwa, for working with our students to facilitate some of these conversations. The music you will hear today focuses on places, people, and events that are fresh in our minds and that resonate deeply in our everyday lives. In the year 2023, black Americans still face racism and injustice on a daily basis. Today, we face this reality while taking time to celebrate black excellence and the hope of a brighter tomorrow, where the words on which our country was founded in 1776 means what they should mean. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This concert is made possible by generous support for the, from the Delaware Humanities Forum, the Mid-Atlantic Arts, and our season sponsor, TD Bank. The choir school is also supported in part by a grant from the Delaware Division of the Arts, a state agency in partnership with the National Endowment for the Arts. And we are grateful for all of you who are here today to applaud the hard work of our students. It takes our entire community to ensure that our students have the opportunities and resources that they deserve, and we are glad that the choir school community is united in our mission. At this time, we ask that you please silence your cell phones. Restrooms are located at the rear of the church through the doors where you entered. Please do not use the doors at the front of the sanctuary. At this time, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Dilworth to speak about his composition, followed by a panel discussion on the monumental work and its impact. I would like to take a moment to introduce our panelists and our moderator as they make their way to the stage. Dr. Dilworth is Vice Dean and Professor of Music Education at Temple University with over 150 published choral compositions and arrangements. Dr. Dilworth is an internationally renowned composer and arranger. He is a frequent presenter at local and national conferences, a frequent conductor of all state choirs, and a board member and a past board chair of Chorus America. James Ray Rhodes is executive director of the Christina Cultural Arts Center right here in Wilmington, a community cultural icon that provides affordable and quality arts education and live performances to all. He is an experienced executive leader, architect, community planner, activist, coach, and educator. Kimberly Wagwa is a conductor and educator with a focus on social justice music, community building through and within music making, and queer and BIPOC advocacy. They have worked with the Tucson Commission on Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Transgender Issues, Temple University, and the Choir School to facilitate dialogue, practice, and interpersonal 
intentional educational practices. Malcolm Richardson of the Choir School of Delaware, our Director of Education and Programming, will moderate the panel discussion. I thank you all for joining us today. To learn more about the panel, please see their bios in our program. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Rallo Dilworth, who will now introduce weather. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> I'm really excited and honored and quite humbled to have this opportunity to speak with you very briefly about weather. Um, I, I want to thank Brittany uh, Stanton and her team for allowing me this opportunity and for programming weather. There are um, many themes in this poem. Uh, this poem was written by a, a Yale poet Claudia Rankine back in June of 2020, and it was written in direct response to the murder of George Floyd. This poem was published in the New York Times and soon was read by people all over the world. Shortly thereafter, I was contacted by the College of New Jersey to set this 28-line poem, and it's really more of an essay, to music, and uh, while it was a very daunting task uh, because these words are extremely powerful, I realized very quickly how important it was to move this message for, forward into the universe. And here we are, uh, three years later almost, and I think you will find that these words are still very relevant uh, to, to this day. There are themes in this poem that all of us can relate to, whether it's the culturally specific theme of resistance against acts of racism and discrimination, or the more humanly universal theme of perseverance under the pressures of a pandemic. I believe this is a story for all to tell, for all to hear, all to honor, and most importantly, a story that all of us, I think, can learn from. I divided this poem up into six segments. It's a, very, it's a contiguous poem, but I decided to divide it up so that I could really look at each segment um, sort of on its, for its own merits. And each of these sections has a different style and a different character. The piece is 20 minutes long. So the first section that you're going to hear, um, I subtitled The Meditation, and you're actually going to hear an African-American spiritual. The, the music, the melody is to a, a spiritual called Stand the Storm. So you're going to hear a piano play, Stand the storm, it won't be long, we'll anchor by and by. Stand the storm, it won't be long, we'll anchor by and by. You'll also, um, in the next section, you'll hear what really sounds like a 12-bar blues. And people have often asked me, why would you use the blues uh, to, to set portions of this poem? And it's because Claudia Rankine actually mentions the word blues quite a few times. I think she talks about the emotions that we may be feeling. The blues, of course, is a secular form of the spiritual uh, that came out of the rural South. And, but she also uses the word blue to refer to, uh, to those in law enforcement. You're going to hear some very powerful words from ranking, such as kneeling on the neck. You're going to hear her talk about eight minutes and 46 seconds, the amount of time originally um, it was believed that George Floyd was actually uh, suffering under uh, the knee of a Minneapolis police officer. Most powerfully in this section, you're going to hear the choir sing the words, I can't breathe, exactly 27 times, and that's because that's the number of times that George Floyd actually uttered those words before he drew his last breath. The next section in the, the uh, piece, I subtitled The Memorial, and this is an opportunity to recognize just a small number of people whose lives have been cut short uh, as a result of excessive force um, or implicit bias or just vigilante racial profiling or racism uh, by either law enforcement or people who wanted to somehow take the law in their own hands. This is a moment in the piece in which you, the audience, get to respond and interact. So as our young people are going to be calling out names in remembrance of these lives that were cut short, 
you will have the opportunity to respond. The choir is going to sing, say their names after each name is read, and you will get to respond if you choose to do so. The next part of the poem is in, um, of the piece is entitled The Meltdown, and this is just a very brief segment in which you're gonna hear a little bit of civil unrest uh, in, in the voices of the choir and in the instruments. And then the next section is a, so, is a march for social justice. The choir is going to sing the words, whatever contracts keep us social compel us now to disorder the disorder. You, the audience, will have an opportunity to march along with the choir and participate in this movement for social justice. And then the final section is entitled The Mobilization. And this is a little bit more of an uplifting, hopeful moment in the poem in which ranking challenges all of us to think about what our part can be in making this world a more fair and, and just place. Again, I'm really humbled by this opportunity. I hope that this message will move forward in a way that it compels all of us to ask ourselves the question, what can I do as an individual? What can I do within my community in order to ensure that people are treated fairly, that racism once and for all um, becomes a thing of the past? Um, thank you for the opportunity, and I welcome um, my fellow panel members to, to come up and we will have a little discussion. Good afternoon, everyone. I know y'all can do better than that. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, kiddos. Um, well, I just wanted to say once again, thank you all for being here. Uh, the work that the students and the adult singers have been putting forward has been very emotionally and spiritually led. Um, and as you can hear from Dr. Dilworth's mention about his piece, um, and you'll get a chance to see it once we perform it, but this piece is art. And we're taking this opportunity right now to just dis discuss what has been the impact of racism and social injustices in our communities and in our world, but how can we utilize music as a way to stand up and fight against those injustices? So um, just bear with us, we'll get to the beautiful music in just a moment, but um, let's just dive right in. So um, my first question will be for both Rallo and Waikwa. Um, what was your experience like working with our children or working with children on a piece like this in general? Um, so I have never worked with kids specifically on social justice music. My background is definitely adults, uh, usually like 20 and up, 25 and up. Um, and so it was honestly refreshing. <laughs> um, children definitely see the world as it is, and it was, it was particularly interesting to see some of the things that got responses that younger kids would say, uh, that older kids would respond to, kind of like how, how children learn the way of the world and the things that they are supposed to say and the things they are not supposed to say, and just how we are cultured as people of color to move through the world um, and so it was amazing just to see, one, how, how well kids see the world, uh, and also that, that evolution to, to how they start to learn to navigate it and keep themselves safe within it. Absolutely, and same question, Rallo. I was really delighted to have a chance to speak to uh, our young people. Um, as Waigwa said, they are much more aware, I think, sometimes than we give them credit for. And as I approached them and wanted to delve into the major themes of this piece, I tried to ask leading questions about to figure out what they knew, not just about racism in general, but specifically how aware they were about current events in, in the news. And these young people were on the ball. They're very much aware, and uh, they were very honest and very open. 
um, and in many cases sort of unfiltered in terms of their willingness to speak about these issues. And, you know, that, that boldness is something that I hope they continue to take forward as they get older. And as Waigwa said, sometimes as, they get, as we all get older, we, the world begins to weigh on us and starts to tell us what we can say, what we can't say, how we can say it, what we can do, what we cannot do. But these young people have very, very definite ideas and feelings about racism and, and social injustices. And I hope that they continue to carry that message and that spirit and that boldness forward uh, as they mature. Thank you for sharing that. And while we're talking about being bold and unapologetic, what were some comments from the students that stood out most to you both? I think my, by far my favorite was we were talking about um, why it's important to stand up for yourself and to stand up for other people when you have the opportunity. Um, and someone said, well, you know, if no one had decided to stand up for themselves and then other people had not part like participated in that, we would still be in the cotton fields, to which there was that exact sound that happened throughout the room. Um, and I thought that that was just really poignant to point out the resilience of people of color, of black people in this country, um, and kind of this collective understanding within the room that we have that perseverance and we have that resilience, and it's almost a unique and inherent trait that we carry with us that I don't think is understood in larger um, mixed audiences yeah. and, and definitely not within like the white general public. There's not that sense of resilience and that sense of kind of urgency to continue to step up for ourselves and perpetuate that there is black excellence and black beauty. I think it was stunning the amount of details that some of the students were able to uh, recall about the summer Fall, the, the spring and summer of 2020, um, because I, again, I asked leading questions about, okay, what was going on at this time? And of course, the, the obvious was, you know, that we were, we were beginning a pandemic. And, but the students were very much aware of who George Floyd was and under what circumstances he was, he was murdered and the desire to to not only digest that, but to, but to understand that this is not right and that somehow we have to do something in order to make a change in our own communities. That, um, that, that sense of awareness and that, that sense of resolve in young people is something that I hope each and every one of you as parents and as siblings and as grandparents and aunts and uncles and godparents are very proud of because these young people are going to do it. I have no doubt about that. They're going to do it. Anything that we didn't do well or we thought we could do better in our generation to make the world a better place, these young people are gonna do it. I have no doubt. Absolutely, and thank you both for sharing that. Um, you mentioned the importance of making a change and an impact on the community, and a person that comes to mind is this gentleman right next to me, Mr. Rhodes. You are such an important leader and a strong leader in our community. And I, I just wonder, why do you believe it's important to have conversations surrounded around social injustices and racism with children? That's a good question. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that, you know, our, our young uh, people or their children's mind are always inquiring about how this affects me and what should I do. So if we try to shelter them from the things that they're either directly involved in or indirectly involved in, we're doing an injustice as well. Uh, during that particular summer of, of 2020, for instance, you know, we had the uprising, um, and I certainly want to mention, I don't need to mention that before George Floyd, there was Rodney King, and after George Floyd, there was Tyree Nichols. So we always want to make sure our children are, are deeply involved with what's going on, whether it's civil disobedience. So when it came time to protest, we wanted to make sure that they knew how to protest so that when the rioting and the looting was going on, that they would exempt themselves from that because they knew how to use their voices and use their voices collectively in good, in good manner. Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, my next question 
will be um, directed to Rallo and Weigel again. Why do you think weather is timeless? That's a good question. I actually wondered, and I'll just be honest with you, when I started writing this piece at the very end of 2020, it took me seven months to write the piece. July, the 4th of July weekend of 2021, I finished it. And when I finished it, I asked myself, how relevant will this piece be in the years to come? And it turns out that three years later, it's still just as relevant because I think that the effects of the pandemic will be with us for quite some time, which is mentioned in the poem, but also the effects of racism and sy systemic racism continue to be with us. And one of the things that I wanted to do in this piece, which you'll hear in the memorial service, is give each and every choir the opportunity to choose which names they wanted to read. Some names I suggested, some names have been added to the list or taken away based upon the decisions of the choir and maybe depending upon what community you're living in. I did this piece in Tallahassee a few weeks ago and we put in, the, the people there, choirs put in some local names. And unfortunately, we keep adding to those names and that was when uh, the decision was made to add Tyree Nichols' name to the list. So unfortunately, this piece will remain timeless in one sense in that there will always be more names to add. And that's unfortunate because we still live in a society where there's so much more work to do in order to ensure that people are not being profiled, people are not being marginalized um, because of whatever differences are perceived and, and how fear sometimes gets the best of, of people and systems when dealing with those who may not look like them or love like them or act like them or worship like them, et cetera. So I think this piece is gonna keep being relevant as long as there is work to be done. What can you add to that? Um, <laughs> I think another reason why weather will continue to expand its reach is, is the sheer accessibility of the piece. Not only do most people know who Dr. Dilworth is um, and have sung many things by him, but because it is framed within the onset of the pandemic, I think it allows more people to access it within themselves through an experience that they understand and in a period when we were all pretty much locked in our houses, something that they could not have escaped. Um, and it allows you just to kind of look back in your own history, regardless of your background, and be like, wow, this is, this is the ways in which I was changed. This is the ways in which other people have been forced to kind of live their lives. And it just, it provides that perfect access point for, for really starting to do introspective work on yourself through something that we can, we can all collectively share, if that makes sense. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, and this is, this last set of questions could be for the entire cast here, um, but when thinking of performances like this, like what does this performance mean to the city of Wilmington? And I think that we can start with um, you, Ray. What does this performance mean to the city of Wilmington? Uh, that's another good question. I think it's a collective call uh, to continue to keep these dialogues open. Uh, we need to continue to keep our children ingrained in uh, being in a city the size of Wilmington. We're not exempt. The same injustices that go on across the country, they also go on here. We've had injustices with police shootings here. We've had injustices with police apprehensions here. Uh, they face injustices every day with bullying. All the things that we think are, that are not on a major scale, the injustices they face in school, the number of suspensions for black and brown kids, these injustices, we need to let them know that they're directly involved in or indirectly. So we can't you know, shut Wilmington out and make it seem like Wilmington, uh, these things don't go on here. So this piece is very important for Wilmington. I hope it's shared in the schools. I hope it's shared in the community centers. Uh, Christina Cultural Arts Center will certainly embrace this and use this as a part of our teachings for our students. Absolutely, and the final question, um, Roach just mentioned bullying, and there's been a common thread centered around social injustices. But like, what conversations should we be walking away 
starting after this evening. I know that um, towards, towards the middle of my conversation with students here, we kind of talked about the things that we face um, with each other. And this is not necessarily to do with race or class or gender or anything like that. But I feel like if you've been in a school and you've been in a choir or you are part of a family, um, there are people who just get on your nerves, who know how to say the wrong thing, um, <laughs> who, who definitely have a mentality that does not align with your values that you would like to meet in the middle and that you would like to share community with and share space with. And so this just allows us, one, in having discussions about things that are difficult, about systematic inequality and racism, kind of just allows us to know each other better as human beings. And it opens the door for being like, why does that annoy me? Is it because I see something of myself in you? Is it because you remind me of somebody? Is it just something that I don't understand? And how can I seek to understand that and have you hopefully see that in me and seek out whatever answer it is that you might not understand in me. Thank you, Wago. I, I think that this piece, while it certainly has, offers maybe some answers for us, I think it's more of a call than anything so more than anything, you know, I am one of those people who've been writing for a long time and, and we often as, as composers, we, we, want, we write because we want people to applaud at the end. I'm not really interested in that in these, day, these days in this stage of my life. What's more important is I want people to walk away really deeply and critically thinking about the message in Claudia Rankine's words. And I, I hope the opportunity is there for some level of transformation in which we don't just say to ourselves, okay, here's the reality, it's been told to me again, but really ask ourselves, what can I physically do to make my community a better place? In what ways can I speak out? In what ways can I speak to my young people about the realities of racism in this country, around the world for that matter? In what ways can I do something? I really think this piece is a call to action. And if we leave this place today not feeling motivated to do something, then I haven't done my job and Claudia Rankine hasn't done hers. So I ask that everybody really have an open mind and an open heart to walk away from this experience feeling as though not only you got something, but that you have something to give as a result. The late, great Maya Angelou said, when you get, give. When you learn, teach. My challenge to you as you leave today is to give and to teach. Wow, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, before we continue with the program, I just wanna thank you all again. Thank you audience for diving in with us. Um, thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Thank you, Waigua and Rallo. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna continue with the program, you all. Um, so just enjoy yourself. If you wanna sing, sing along. Um, and just have a good time.
a scrap of paper in the archive, it is written, I have forgotten my umbrella. Turns out, in a pandemic, everyone, not just the philosopher, is without. We scramble in the drought of information held back by inside traders, drop by drop. Face covering? No. Yes. Social distancing? Six feet under for underlying conditions. Black. Just us and the blues, kneeling on a neck with the full weight of a man in blue. Eight minutes and 46 seconds. In extremis, I can't breathe gives way to asphyxiation, to giving up this world. And then mama, called to, a call to protest, fire, glass, Say their names, say their names. White silence equals violence. The violence of, again, a militarized police force tear gassing, bullets ricochet, and civil unrest taking it, burning it down. Whatever contracts keep us social compel us now to disorder the disorder. Peace. We're out to repair the future. There's an umbrella by the door. Not for yesterday, but for the weather that's here. I say weather, but I mean a form of governing that deals out death and names it living. I say weather, but I mean a November that won't be held off. This time, nothing, no one forgotten. We are here for the storm that's storming because what's taken matters.
My name is Quinn and I am nine years old. And my name is Ian and I'm seven years old. We wanted to take a moment to thank you for supporting the choir school by joining us today. It means a lot to us that you came. The choir school is really important to all of us on the stage. We love singing together and we love our after school program. If you can, please consider making a gift to the choir school today so we can continue to keep up, to keep the program affordable for all of us. And it lets us offer this annual concert with a pay what you can ticket price. On your way out, our staff will be at the doors with baskets. There are also QR codes to scan in your program and on science. If you would like to give online, thank you so much. We hope you enjoy the rest of the concert.
Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us today in this thought-provoking and inspiring program. Before we close with a beloved choir school tradition of singing total praise, I want to share a couple upcoming dates to mark your calendars and leave you with some final thoughts. Please save the date for March 2nd through March 3rd, 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. for Do More 24, Delaware's annual day of giving. This is a 24-hour statewide celebration where donors and nonprofits from all across Delaware rally to drive support for causes that matter. When you give any amount to the choir school in these 24 hours, your dollar goes further for our students. Your gift makes us eligible for additional funds and incentives for a prize pool. This is a powerful opportunity to make an impact. Please check your program for more information and a QR code to set a reminder to give on those days. And as Elin and Quinn said, we will gladly accept gifts today, and any gifts of cash or check received today will go towards the Do More 24 goal. Thank you so much for your support, and we hope that you will do more with us. Our next concert will explore themes of nature, environmental justice, and our shared responsibility to protect our planet. We hope that you will join us again on April 29th, back here at Grace. More information and tickets are on our website now. Finally, I want to return to a thought from the start of the concert. Black history is American history. And so, black history is our shared history. No matter our race, perspective, or background, we are all called to learn, to educate, to celebrate this month and every month so that we can work together to create a more equitable future. We hope you leave inspired to take action against racial injustice across America and in your community. We, and with renowned joy and strength from song and from each other. Thank you. <laughs> 